I'm Jared Taylor with American Renaissance, and this is a short history of American immigration and how it has changed our country. The great French philosopher Auguste Comte once said, demography is destiny. Today, I'd like to talk about the demographic destiny of the United States and how it has been transformed in just the last 50 years. At the time the United States was first established as an independent country, and for nearly 200 years after that, we had an immigration policy explicitly designed to keep the country European. The United States came into existence when the Constitution, which was signed in 1787, took effect in 1789. That same year, the very first Congress met in New York's City Hall. That initial Congress passed important laws to set the course for a brand new country. It established the courts and the major federal departments, and it decided who could become an American. It passed the first naturalization law, which limited citizenship to, and I quote, free white persons of good character. At that time, no one thought diversity was a strength. John Jay, who was one of the founders and who served as the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, put it this way in 1787. Providence has been pleased to give this one connected country to one united people, a people descended from the same ancestors, speaking the same language, professing the same religion, attached to the same principles of government, very similar in their manners and customs. However, there was one important exception to the homogeneity that so pleased John Jay, and that was blacks. By the time the transatlantic slave trade ended in 1808, 17% of the country's 7 million people were black. Indians were hardly considered part of the country at all. Immigration to America began in earnest around 1830, but it was entirely European, mainly from Ireland, Germany, and Britain. The conception of the United States as a nation of free white persons of good character was so strong that the government wasn't even sure about the status of anyone else. It was only after the Civil War and the passage of the 14th Amendment in 1868 that blacks were granted federal citizenship. As for American Indians, the last tribes did not become citizens until 1924. As time went on, there were new sources of immigration, such as Italy and Poland, but new immigrants came almost exclusively from Europe. Ellis Island became the symbol of this more recent immigration, and between 1892 and 1954, more than 12 million people passed through its gates. Immigrants were quarantined or sent back if they had certain diseases or if they had unacceptable political views. Here are radicals who were refused entry and are waiting to be sent back home. They might have been free white persons, but they were not thought to be of good character. By 1960, there were 180 million Americans, of whom 90% had origins in Europe. Almost all the rest were blacks or Indians. In 1965, however, there was a radical change in immigration policy. The 1960s were the time of the Civil Rights Movement, and some Americans thought that an exclusively European immigration policy was outmoded. Also, the Cold War was raging, and the United States was competing with the Soviet Union for influence in the Third World. It was harder to compete when communists could say to Africans or Asians, those capitalist Americans, they let, in, let, they let in white immigrants, but not people who look like you. Well, that was easy for the Soviets to say. They had no immigration at all. But thus it was that in 1965, Congress voted a complete overhaul of immigration laws that opened the United States to the entire world. However, that law was sold to Congress and the American people as largely symbolic. 
Senator Edward Kennedy, one of the most vocal sponsors of the law, famously said, First, our cities will not be flooded with a million immigrants annually. The present level of immigration remains substantially the same. Secondly, the ethnic mix of this country will not be upset. At the signing ceremony, President Lyndon Johnson said, This bill we sign today is not a revolutionary bill. It does not affect the lives of millions. It will not restructure the shape of our daily lives. Well, the senator and the president got it wrong. Kennedy said there wouldn't be higher levels of immigration. In fact, from 1925 until 1965, when the new bill was passed, there was an average of about 178,000 newcomers every year. Immigration has risen steadily, and for the last 15 years, we have averaged well over a million immigrants a year, more than five times as many as Kennedy said we would get. And that's just legal immigrants. And what about the ethnic mix? As you can see on this graph, 75% of the foreign-born people living in the United States in 1960 were from Europe, and 10% were from North America, mostly Canada. Only 9% were from Latin America, and just 5% from Asia. Fifty years later, as you can see, the foreign-born population was overwhelmingly Hispanic and Asian. And here we see the results of that huge increase. The vertical columns indicate the number of inhabitants born overseas. In the entire 20th century, the maximum number of foreign-born, that was in 1930, was 14.2 million, and these people were almost all Europeans. In 2010, the number of foreign-born had climbed to 40 million, of which only a small minority were from Europe. The red line on the graph is the percentage of the total population born overseas. That percentage was dropping until 1965 when the law was passed, but it has since shot up. And most of these foreigners become U.S. citizens. They have to pass a very simple test and then take the oath of citizenship. Here's a typical ceremony that took place in Minnesota recently. Immigrants have a lot more children than natives. As a result, the percentage of the population that is white has dropped dramatically since the change in immigration laws. Whites were still 80% of the population in 1980, but were only 62% in 2010. According to official Census Bureau predictions, whites will become a minority in 2042. According to longer-term projections, by 2060, Hispanics will be an outright majority, and whites will be only 30% of the population. This is breathtaking. In only 100 years, a blink of an eye in historical terms, whites will have gone from 90% to 30%, and the nation will be majority Hispanic. Three-fifths of the Hispanics will be Mexican. So the United States will have, in effect, been absorbed by Mexico. This map shows where Mexican populations are concentrated. The dark line is the Mexican border before the Mexican-American War of 1846-1848. Mexicans think that anything south of that line was stolen from them. Therefore, since the 19th century, Mexicans and other Hispanics think the border is illegitimate and that they have the right to cross it at any time. That's why we have 11 or 12 million illegal immigrants in the country, of whom 80% are Hispanic. And they think they have every right to be here. This is a picture taken in 2005 of Hispanics demonstrating in Los Angeles for amnesty for illegals. Well, what kind of country are we likely to have when the United States becomes majority Hispanic? I could cite many sobering statistics on rates of crime, illegitimacy, poverty, diabetes, AIDS infection, welfare dependency, etc., etc., but I'll cite just two. Although Hispanics drop out of high school at about three times the white rate, 
The ones who make it to 12th grade are on average four years behind the average white student. That's right. They are reading and doing math at the, at the level of the average white eighth grader. I would add that on average, blacks are doing slightly worse than Hispanics, although Asians do considerably better. Needless to say, we are not supposed to think very much about the fact that our country is turning into an extension of Mexico with a strong flavor of Africa and Asia. But if we do, we are supposed to think this new diversity will be a marvelous improvement over the nation that Teddy Kennedy and his friends have so drastically changed. But let me put it to you this way. Can you think of a single majority non-white neighborhood you'd like to live in? Or a majority non-white school you'd want to send your children to? Probably not. And yet, we are turning the whole country majority non-white. At the same time, Hispanics and others are ecstatic about their growing numbers and their growing influence. As Jorge Ramos, the well-known anchorman for the Spanish-language television network Univision, says about Hispanics, and I quote, We are everywhere, and there is no occupation or activity in this country that escapes our influence. This century is ours. Well, don't let that bother you. That's healthy ethnic pride. But woe unto any white person who says he doesn't like the idea of his people being replaced. He'll be accused of hatred, intolerance, white supremacy. Of course, not wanting your people replaced is natural, normal, healthy. I don't want to be replaced. My ancestors built the country that Jorge Ramos and his pals think they are taking over. My ancestors and millions of others built a country firmly rooted in European traditions, and they believed it would remain European forever. No one ever asked them if they wanted to turn the place over to Mexicans and Asians. And if they had been asked, they would have said, Hell no. What we are seeing is a tragedy. A tragedy with many causes and many consequences. But if you care about your heritage, your people, and the future of your country, the first thing you must realize is that if you feel deep in your bones that your country has taken a wrong turn, you're right. It makes no difference whatever names you are called. You're still right. And you are not alone. Demography is destiny. And if you ignore the effects of demography, you and your children will have no destiny. Thanks for listening.